thanks to our exhibition sponsors. The Road Ahead is made possible by the generosity of the Erin Krantz Fund, Barbara and Morton Mandel Design Gallery Endowment Fund, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, and the August Heckscher Exhibition Fund. We've had a very exciting day here at the museum. Um, perhaps some of you noticed in the exhibition there are five um, student projects in sort of our more historical um, concept um, part of the exhibition. And in conjunction with The Road Ahead, Cooper Hewitt invited undergraduate and graduate level university students to answer the question, how might automation change the mobility of people, goods, and services? Students from around the country submitted designs and five were selected be to be part of the mobility exhibition. Today, the five selected projects from Arizona, State University, Harvard, University of Michigan, Kane University, and the University of Washington participated in a design review with tonight's panel of experts. Many of these designers, young designers, are in the audience with us tonight. It's a little hard to see with the lights off, but maybe you can just raise your hands. See a few of them out there. Let's give them a round of applause. And perhaps this has jump-started your career in the future of mobility. Uh, tonight we are delighted to have three of the leaders in the field who are exploring the future of mobility. Each has groundbreaking and inspiring projects represented in the road ahead. Jack Robbins is a principal and the director of urban design at NYC-based FX Collaborative. He works with public and private clients to create vibrant, sustainable cities bringing a design-oriented approach to creatively solving complex challenges. He leads mixed-use development projects spanning urban infrastructure, transportation, multifamily residential developments, and large-scale master plans. He offers a keen understanding of the designer's responsibility to the public. He is an active voice in the wider design community and also currently teaches in the real estate program at NYU. Ryan Powell leads a user experience design team for Waymo in Mountain View, California, where a talented group of researchers and designers are taking a human-centered approach to designing the world's first driverless ride-hailing service. The primary goal is safety. Ryan's passion for people design and the belief that technology can improve the everyday life have been at the center of his career for the past 20 plus years. He is especially adept at helping organizations figure out how to create simple, delightful, and differentiated experiences that appeal to consumers across a variety of global markets. Prior to Waymo, Ryan led teams at Google, Samsung, Xbox, and Motorola. Sarah Williams is an associate professor of technology and urban planning and director of the Civic Data Design Lab at MIT's School of Architecture and Planning, which works with data, maps, and mobile technologies to develop interactive design and communication strategies to reveal urban policy issues to broader audiences. Trained as a geographer, landscape architect, and urban planner, she combi combines geographic analysis and design in particularly insightful projects. She is best known for her work as part of the Million Dollar Blocks team that highlighted the cost of incarceration, digital met metadis, which developed the first data set on an informal transit ser system, searchable in Google Maps, and more recently, she is using social media data to understand housing vacancy in ghost cities in China. Sarah's design work has been widely exhibited, including here at Cooper Hewitt. Tonight's moderator is Cynthia E. Smith, Cooper Hewitt's curator of socially responsive responsible design, and one of the three co-curators for The Road Ahead. The exhibition's third curator is our esteemed colleague, Julie Pastor. To begin, Jack, Ryan, and Sarah will each give a short overview about their innovative mobility work, joined by Cynthia for a conversation, and then we will leave 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A. Thank you all for coming, and hope to see you on the 12th.
Um, thank you, and thank you for this uh, opportunity. Thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm Jack Robbins. I'm the Director of Urban Design for FX Collaborative. Um, and I want to talk about um, um, mobility and this sort of new era of mobility that we're entering into and public space. Um, we're um, in at the, at the dawn of this period of tremendous change in mobility. There are all of these new technologies coming on, and they're going to impact how we move around. How are they going to impact how we move around? Well, no one really knows. And with this caveat, um, <laughs> I will in, indulge in uh, a little speculation and a little creative thinking. Um, the future of, of autonomous vehicles in particular is going to have the biggest impact. And there uh, have been, Robin Chase and others have characterized these as sort of a heaven and a hell scenario. Right? The, the heaven scenario is that autonomous vehicles means fewer cars, fewer vehicle miles traveled, um, more space for other things. The hell scenario is um, more vehicles, more vehicle miles traveled. It could be um, one or both of those. But that autonomous vehicles will be circling around with or without people in them, and it's going to just cause more of the kinds of traffic problems that we already have. Um, there are a lot of different companies getting into this. It's a very kind of crowded field, um, all different aspects of uh, AV technology. And there's a tremendous amount of money being spent. Um, this <laughs> Brookings Institute report said there are $80 billion spent in a, in a three-year period by these private companies uh, on AV technology. Um, the public sector is way behind on this, um, both uh, in spending uh, and I think in, in kind of creativity and thinking. Um, if we look at the, the kinds of things that um, AV companies um, are promising that will make our lives better, um, and we look at what kind of companies are making those promises, car companies, tech and software companies, ride service companies, um, and then think about how each of those makes their money. I think there's a real disconnect between what's on the right side of the screen and what's on the left side of the screen. And that's the disconnect that we need to be aware of. Um, if we look back uh, 100 years or so to the last time there was a major um, revolution, a major change in mobility when the automobile um, started to take over uh, our streets and our way of life and our way of building, uh, it forced things like transit, like the streetcar systems, uh, out of business. Um, some of that was just people preferring cars. Some of that was some very competitive and questionable business practices by the companies that, that stood to profit by it. This is a map, by the way, of all of the streetcar lines in Brooklyn. Um, we're now struggling to get just one line built in Brooklyn. Um, and <laughs> this uh, really led to the, the destruction and the dismantling of uh, public streetcar lines in cities across the country, not just New York. Um, so here we are now. Uh, the city of New York, one of the sponsors for the driverless future uh, competition. Um, how should cities respond to this coming future of driverless vehicles? Um, at my firm, we, we um, were interested in this idea. It was just beginning to sort of have an impact on the work that we do, especially for the sort of longer range planning that I do. If you're planning a, a, a district uh, for 50 years out, how much parking do you plan for? What kind of roadways? We have no idea. So we really wanted to get our heads around it. And we um, spent several sessions uh, over beers kind of drinking and, and brainstorming and trying to wrap our heads around what this um, new technology would mean. Uh, and one of the things that we found is that we kept coming back to drawing more green space and more open space. And we said, what if we had a way, a, a unitized, systematic way to create that green space? And what we came up with is Public Square, which you can see uh, in the exhibit upstairs. This is a modular system for taking over vehicle space as green pedestrian space, and particularly for taking over uh, parking space, because whether you believe in the in the heaven scenario or the hell scenario, there is no reason with autonomous vehicles for them to park on the street. That street parking becomes space that's available. And 
by creating a platform, a module, it becomes an open source for all kinds of creativity invention. These modules can have different surface applications from uh, bathrooms to bike stands to kiosks to green space to community gardens. Um, we're building on proven technologies, so the kind of modular systems that, that bike share stands represent that can be deployed and taken away and, and moved around relatively easily. Um, we're <coughs> building on the popularity of street seat programs that repurpose parking space, spaces for pedestrian activities. Um, and the general um, trend in, in New York and in other cities for reclaiming um, vehicular space for pedestrian space, like the DOT Plaza program. With these modules, these can be recombined in lots of different ways to make whatever different kind of environment, and it can be incremental. The RPA estimated that New York City has uh, 24 square miles of on-street parking. Think about that, 24 square miles of public owned city land that is used for the, for the temporary storage of private vehicles. If you were to take just one out of every 20 spaces, just 5% of that land, and convert it with public square to open green space, that is the equivalent of adding another central park to the city. Small amounts of change can make big change. Um, one of the things that we're excited about since we won that competition is the um, potential for stormwater benefits because as you incrementally add uh, uh, public square units to the street, you can deal with the stormwater um, system. You can um, absorb it, you can evaporate it, you can use it for um, the, the plant material that's there. Um, and one of the reasons that we're excited about that is because this is something that actually has a lot of, of money behind it. Cities are spending large amounts of money to solve their stormwater problems. And if we can make this into some, as a way to solve that problem, um, it becomes something that it's worth cities investing in. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this, um, our uh, five principles for a driverless future. Um, one is to plan for change. Cities and governments need to um, be experimental and figure out how to uh, plan for incremental change. The second is that it's got to be used to enhance the public realm. So much of the, uh, the dialogue and the discussion is about the technology and not about the space that we live in. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity, as I talked about with stormwater, to um, enhance environmental sustainability. Um, we need to prioritize shared and public resources, and that includes the streets, the transit systems, um, and shared vehicles. And lastly, it's got to be done with public-private alliances. Um, the private sector is investing in this. The public sector is just beginning to wake up to it, but they really are going to need to work together. The street is ultimately the place where the public and the private come together. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming out on uh, this windy evening um, tonight. I'm Ryan Powell, and I lead up our user research uh, design team at Waymo. And um, it's my first time actually at the Cooper Hewitt, so I'm really excited to be here with everybody tonight. Um, so our goal at, at Waymo is to make it um, safe and easy for uh, everything to get around. So we think about people, we think about um, about packages and, and goods, and uh, that's really the core of what we're trying to do at, at Waymo. We're approaching this from a technology um, perspective, so we're very much um, in a mindset where we, we think about uh, creating the world's most experienced driver in terms of our technology versus like an actual vehicle. And so our goal, our vision is that we can integrate our technology with a lot of different partners to then um, bring a lot of different services uh, to market. The designers and researchers that work on my team are very motivated by our mission, and when you take a look at some of these numbers, you can begin to understand why. So in the US, about 94% of auto accidents involve some type of human error. We have um, about 3 million uh, Americans over the age of 40 that, have bl or that are blind or have low vision. And um, on average, people tend to spend or waste uh, about 42 um, hours 
uh, a year in traffic, and that of course can be much higher if you're from like San Francisco, like my like like I am. So um, a lot of you may know that that Waymo is uh, was started out as Google's self-driving car project. So since 2009, we've driven 10 million autonomous miles. And we have um, a program in Phoenix today where we have hundreds of, of riders that are using our service every month um, to do things like go to work, um, to go to school, to go out and meet friends on the weekends. And they do that um, through an app that they use to hail our car to have them to pick them up from point A and, and to go to point B. So when we think about autonomy and the, uh, this service, we um, are very much sort of... Um, my day-to-day -day life is, is very much uh, breathing and, and sort of um, and sleeping all these problems about sort of how do you bring a technology like this to a city and, and solve some of these near-term problems that we're focused on. Um, so our, the way that self-driving technology works is it's a combination of, of LiDAR and cameras and, cameras and, um, and radar. And so those, those sensors, they all have different strengths and weaknesses, and they sort of work in concert together, together to give the vehicle um, basically its, its vision or its sight. And so our vehicles, for example, can see 360 degrees around itself. Um, we can see up to three football fields away. And uh, an example, radar is really good at looking at, at objects that are very, very far away and to tell you what kind of speed that that object is traveling towards you. That's what, why on the highway, when you see a police officer and they're, they're using a radar gun. Um, LIDAR, of course, is able to kind of uh, paint a picture of what's happening around the vehicles. And so the video upstairs kind of goes through those different, um, those different sensors and talks about how we take a, you know, again, kind of give the vehicle sight. And then, of course, uh, at, at the same time, once a vehicle sort of understands its, its environment, a big part in what the technology is doing is it's, it's also um, predicting behavior. And so when we can recognize an object, so say it's, a hu uh, say it's an adult versus a child, those, different, those objects have different behavior profiles. And so the way that an adult might move is going to be much different than how a, how, how a child would, would move. And so when the car thinks about predicting sort of the different trajectories for those different objects, that's what it's taking into account by um, by sort of classifying the different objects that are around it. Same thing with like pedestrians or cyclists that are around you. They all have different behavior patterns. And that's what the car is doing. And that's what this video talks a lot about. And so I often get asked like when I'm home um, for like the holidays, you know, what's it like to, you know, ride in a self-driving car? How does it feel? And it feels for the most part, just like you would in a, in a car that's driven by a human. There are times where our vehicles, um, of course, they're, they are, we, we obey all the traffic, um, uh, you know, rules and stuff. And so when a curb says, you know, there's no pulling over or stopping between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., we won't do that. So our vehicles are very courteous. And so you kind of become more aware, I think, as you uh, ride around in a self-driving car of just how much we as humans tend to kind of bend the rules occasionally and um, make a lot of assumptions about our environment. But, um, you know, the car is also, because it has almost like these superhuman, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, attributes or abilities, it does at times kind of navigate the environment a little bit differently. But I, what I usually tell people is that, you know, again, it's because the car can see all the way around it. It can see, you know, um, much farther than a human can see. And if we as humans were able to have um, access to what the car understands about its environment, we would probably change our behavior today um, in terms of how we drive. And so, so for the most part, it feels um, it feels I mean, we we work very hard to make it feel like um, like a trip that is driven by a human, and uh, and so my team spends a lot of time also thinking about when you put people into a self-driving car and there is no human there, you know what are the what are their needs, and so you know when you drive with somebody that and you're in a car, there's a lot of communication that happens between you and the driver. There's direct communication in terms of you asking the the driver. Or, hey, you know, um, which route are we going to, going to take? Or it, it can be indirect communication where you notice the driver sort of reposition their hands on the steering wheel. And so when you think about, and you, and you know that's a signal that the car, the driver's about ready to make a, a turn. 
And so we think a lot about um, that communication as designers when we think about the interface that you see in the car and how do we directly communicate with you in terms of this is the route that we're going to take or you know it's safe to get out of the car now or that the front door was left open versus some of the indirect things around in terms of hey you know this is everything that the car can see and um, you know as a means to sort of generate trust between the writer and our technology that's a big theme um, in the work that I do back in in Mountain View so if you uh, if you come back and take a look at this video it does a nice three minute job of trying to um, uh, summarize um, some of those things but uh, but yeah again I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and um, so it's nice to see such a big turnout to uh, for the conversation tonight Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Williams. I run the Civic Data Design Lab at MIT. And my research lab is very interested in how we can use data um, to affect policy change. So we are really interested in the massive amount of data that's been created by driver's cars, um, which was uh, probably a very similar video that we were just going to see. And as you move through the environment, as these cars move through the environment, they're creating essentially a whole other reality, uh, a kind of digital reality. Um, this reality um, is what they need to get around in the cars. The, the robotic systems need to have a digital version of the landscape in order to know how to navigate, to see humans on the street, to avoid them. And this uh, data, um, it, you know, if, if you can think about the massive amount of data that it is as every car is recreating this landscape, not just one car creating it one time, but in real time. Um, and um, it's equivalent to um, all of the tweets that, um, we currently have in uh, one year, just one hour of that um, is the data. Um, you can see um, here are some other kinds of visualizations that we've created um, as we're driving along the roadway. Um, Self-driverless cars um, even create their own landscape as they, uh, we have uh, virtual worlds that they used to train themselves on. So it's not just training themselves um, in the real world on these cases, but they've uh, created virtual landscapes that they train um, themselves through machine learning. Um, and Waymo um, has a video game itself uh, to help train the cars. Um, and all of this really amounts to what I would consider a new digital infrastructure very similar to uh, the turn of the century when we had electricity and electricity was becoming this new resource. Um, this new digital landscape is a new resource, I would argue, in the same way um, that uh, electricity has been and it can be tapped into all kinds of uses. So um, if we have a digital landscape, we can uh, provide advertisements and augmented reality applications as we're driving through the environment. By having this d digital landscape, we can insert um, different kinds of services into our uh, world that is based off of this digital world. Um, Google has already started to create um, an augmented reality app out of this digital landscape. Have anybody seen the, the fox? Um, and so instead of having directions on your Google phone, you follow the fox through an augmented space. Um, and that's really because we have this digital landscape that's available made fr from cars and other kinds of uh, applications. Um, another example of an application is... Um, <clears throat> Uh, we're using the landscape. This is a person who is uh, seeing impaired and is using um, a headset to navigate because um, that digital world exists. Uh, the headphones can tell her how to move through the environment, where there's a trash can, uh, where there might be services uh, provided. And so um, if you think about it, 
um, this new landscape can provide all kinds of public goods. I just showed you two options, but I imagine you guys are all really creative and can start thinking of different services. And I like to think of it not just as a new electricity infrastructure, but even think about it as the internet. It's a new platform in which lots of services will be built upon. But the question is, who owns this public good? Um, we haven't... Right now, it's Waymo's creating the data. They own, they own this public good. Um, uh, and I mean, it's very surely within their hands. Um, they've made the technology to develop it, and they're storing it. Um, and so, how do we make relationships with the many businesses that are collecting this data to help create and improve services in our urban spaces? Um, at the same time, as we saw, autonomous vehicles can be good or evil. Uh, that we saw the halo and the, um, the devil horns earlier. But um, one thing I'm not sure people realize is many cities, over 50% of their budget comes from transit-related uh, costs, right? So the parking meter, your taxes for your car, uh, parking lots, uh, parking tickets, all kinds of translated. And so um, there's a lot of discussion about what happens when we don't have that budget or revenue coming in um, and who's in charge of that? Is that money now going to a private company? And how do cities make a relationship with these private companies to ensure that, well, this is a dramatic, they don't, turn into financial ruin. But what's the incentive for a business to do something like that? They've, caught, they've spent the money. It, it, data is their business. This is their value. And I think what it really is um, up to us as cities and citizens to start to make relationships with private organizations to ensure that this public good has the benefit for all. So would it be regulation? Nobody likes to hear that word. No, and probably Waymo doesn't like it. Or he can, you can tell us later. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think regulation at this point is really important. Cities start n need to realize that this public good exists. When they allow companies and AV vehicles to come into their cities, they need to make relationships to have co-ownership or co-access to the data. They are, in fact running on our city streets that are paid with tax dollars. How can we create um, a win situation between both? But we've already seen that regulations have gone out the door in many places. Uh, for example, in Virginia, lawmakers have taken a completely hands-off approach to autonomous vehicles, and they want to encourage innovation. And encouraging innovation is good. We should certainly do that. Um, so... <clears throat> We need to think about what happens in the lack of regulation. And I do a lot of work in Nairobi where there's no regulation on um, these kind of Uber-like matatus that run through the, the city. So as we saw in previous presentations, um, simply put, building cities around cars increases congestion, discourages the use of public transit, encourages sprawl all of which urban planners generally disapprove of. The odd thing is that AVs could either reverse or accelerate each one of these trends. So there's good and bad. But I think that I'd like to make a call to everybody to say that we own the city of the future and we must co-own the data that's generated from it. Thank you. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you all, Sarah, uh, Ryan, and Jack. Um, so uh, I want to get started right away. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. I, I am hoping that we can have some Q&A at the end. Uh, we're right at 7.30. We're going to go uh, up until 8.00. Um, so uh, we organized the exhibition along six uh, distinct provocations. If any of you have been up to the uh, exhibition, each of your talks uh, hit on one or more, one or more of those open-ended questions. How might we design new mobility experiences? How might shared data improve urban design? How might new mobility systems change the design of streets? Um, 
each of these elements are becoming more and more interwoven. Um, my question to you all is, what do we need to get fundamentally right today to ensure that in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we're living uh, in a more utopian world uh, with safer, cleaner, more connected, equitable, accessible mobility options? Uh, sure, I can I can start with that. Um, I, I you know I think that um, paying attention to to public space is a is a big part of it. Um, it's where it's where the city lives, and um, understanding how these technologies are going to affect that public space, and getting the the city governments that that own and control the public space to. To think about that and to and to um, loosen up a little bit. I think there's going to be a period in this period of tremendous change. There's going to need to be experimentation, and the you know the the um, tech uh, sector you know comes at it with a philosophy of fail faster, um, so that they can go iterate and go through things. Um, that's the last thing that that the city government would ever want to do. Right? They're like, don't fail, and, and if you do fail, I didn't do it, you know, someone else's uh, fault. Um, so, like, I think, I think there needs to be a real mind shift um, in, f tr you know, being creative about how to solve these problems, being aware of the problems, being creative about how to solve them, um, and doing it in a, in a kind of collaborative and, and creative way. It's interesting, because uh, I think Seattle is one uh, city that's trying to um, put together contracts a little bit different, these smaller contracts, so that they can try things out, prototype things, and then if they fail, they can quickly switch to doing something different. So there are some locations that are... There is hope. Yes, attempting. And yeah, I, I mean, kind of seconding what Jack is saying here, I think designing with an awareness that things are changing, and so you're really not designing a thing that, you know, that might, you, well, you're making something that might only serve a purpose for the next five years or seven years, and then once you sort of transition to an, the next stage, how does that sort of evolve, uh, that thing evolve with, um, you know, with the rest of what's changing? So I think that's that's super important, but I, I like the, the idea of um, experimentation. I mean, on a small scale, you know, um, in San Francisco, where I live, there's a sort of a main street in one of the neighborhoods where it's super super popular with restaurants and a lot of shops and things. And they have stopped allowing um, ride hailing companies to stop on that street because it was just causing too much congestion. And so what they're experimenting with is, is having those, um, those vehicles pick folks up on sort of the side um, subsidiary streets. And so having to walk a little bit of, uh, you know, a short distance um, is something that they're, they're trying. And it's actually not as bad as it sounds. It's, um, I did it. Just yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so I think that ty those types of experiments are where you're just kind of, um, you know, trying things where there's a low cost, um, but there could be a high benefit is something, you know, I think that, that cities could take into, into account. Um, I think that, um, as you said, cities are kind of adverse to change. And uh, I think this is like a, kind of the argument I'm trying to make with the data sets too, is that um, if they don't start making, I, I really think they need to start uh, making these kind of incremental moves or they'll be way behind. Uh, their public space will be lost to them, right, in a way. Um, they'll be reappropriated, reacquired. So how do we make sure that the public realm remains a public realm um, in the way that we want to see it in cities? So I think, um, you know, starting to think about what happens in the parking space is something that cities are avoiding because they're waiting f they're waiting for the technology and then they'll be responsive rather than kind of right. thinking about them being, proactive. Ba them being proactive. And I think TNCs are a very good example of that. Like now we have TNCs in the airport, but I mean, it's a, it, it took a crisis to make some of these kind of design. Yeah. And I think we want to not get into that kind of crisis situation, I think I had. So uh, in the US, 30% of individuals with disabilities have difficulty accessing transportation. One of the promises of new mobility is improved access. Can each of you tell us more about how designs incorporating shared data, new technologies like 
autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, connected vehicles, and streetscapes could improve access for people living with physical and cognitive disabilities? I, I can start. Um, so it's definitely something that one of the um, big things that motivates me at Waymo is I like the fact that what we're starting out with as our first sort of application of our technology is a service. And so that makes it much more accessible than to people with different, um, you know, different, uh, you know, different needs or different backgrounds and versus a, a vehicle that you would go out and purchase and have to you know, potentially sink a, you know, a lot of money into. And so I think the switch from ownership to service, I think is one, is one, um, you know, is one th thing to think about. And certainly as we think about like our user experience and we're designing um, that end-to-end -end user experience, we do take into consideration a lot of um, you know, people that have different needs and how do, how do we make um, our service more accessible. And so I think what's, the, what's exciting about it is the, the fact that, um, you know, or the opportunity to, for, for people to have more flexibility and freedom than they might have today. I mean, um, you know, as I, as I showed in my presentation, I mean, the potential services that can benefit people who have disabilities are huge. Um, you're creating a digital landscape that can help um, visually hearing impaired, other kinds of impairments really get around. And um, I think that's, it. that's a great potential. But the, the question is how then do we provide that so how do how do people access that or afford that, right? Um, and I think this is what where I get nervous is that like this is a great service that's created by a private company and it's amazing. Now cities need to make sure that they help support that. Um, but then whose responsibility is it for us to help support that? Is it the government's responsibility? Is it Waymo's responsibility? These questions are still in the air, but it has this huge potential to really help uh, the public. Yeah, I, mean, I would just agree with that. The, the potential is tremendous, um, uh, really unlimited, and, and I think it's not just um, uh, people with disabilities. It starts to get to the sort of larger picture of equity, and, and you know, we're, we're, we have an opportunity here. We're, we're redesigning the world of mobility, right? We, we, there's this tremendous potential to really make it work better and work better for everyone, um, but there's also, um, tremendous uh, uh, risk and, and pitfalls and a question of, of who's setting the agenda. Yeah, um, there was a, uh, and it was actually an article that uh, you showed in your PowerPoint um, about this city in France, uh, Bordeaux, I believe it was, that charges a flat fee, $50 a month, for unlimited access to multiple modes of transit, from trains to bikes to ferries to buses. So this is the mobility as a service, um, uh, a good example, uh, and an equitable version. Um, but here in the US, um, and, and there, ridership is up because of this. They've had to uh, increase uh, a lot of more infrastructure, but ridership is up. But here in the US, San Francisco, uh, public transit ridership is down, in large part to ride hailing um, uh, with the advent of, advent of the uh, AV fleets, there could be even further decline. Kind of what you all showed in each of your, well, both of you showed in, <laughs> in your uh, presentations. Um, so how do we, do we, uh, can the US uh, do some sort of uh, mass transit um, effort like this, uh, like they did in Bordeaux where they, connected all of this, Finland's doing something similar, um, so that mass transit can continue to fit into the equation. Uh, each city is very different. New York City uh, is primarily a mass transit city. Um, LA is different from New York. Can we do this in the United States? We're a very different country. A lot, when we have Dallas's and Houston's and, you know, where people are driving cars. Um, there are examples of some cities that are doing this. Actually, Minneapolis has, um, you can pay one for one card and you can go through them your bike. Um, they have actually a car sharing program that's included in that. Maybe 
Uh, they don't have a, a Uber-like surface that goes with it, but um, there are cities that are trying um, to start doing that in the, in the U.S. Um, uh, I, it, it's what's interesting is I just had a student who did their thesis about it. The problem is technology integration. Like mm. one of the biggest limitations is integrating the technology for your metro card that then goes to your bike card, then goes. So it's actually something. Uh, like a limitation that we can make more open. I, I'm um, I'm very pessimistic about this this integration. I mean, it's great that some cities are trying, but I think they're about to be overrun by the juggernaut of uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, Google and and um, Alphabet are the uh, the parent company of Google and Waymo are the largest single investor, single company investor in autonomous vehicle technology. So let's let's take a quick poll. How many of you in this room used Google in the last 24 hours? <laughs> How many of you paid Google for that service? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That the the companies are in the business of of selling advertising and harvesting data. The, the idea that they uh, are going to contribute to sort of first and last mile for transit is total BS. They will, they will, price, the, they will price the ride so that it does ma not make sense for you to get out of an autonomous vehicle and onto public transit, right? They will keep you in that vehicle to harvest data, to, to push advertising. It's how they make their money. I, like, it's, the, it's how the company is set up. I don't think it's in, in, you know, inherently evil. It's just what they do. Um, but it is not compatible with transit. Well, that, that is Google's business model. Um, and that Google makes money you know, through display ads. But um, Waymo is a, is a separate company. Um, we are under the Alphabet umbrella. And um, you know, I can tell you as somebody from the inside, um, you know, we we really are focused on that mission of first and foremost making it safe to eat, you know safe for people and, and things to get around, and so I I think of like San Francisco where we we don't have we don't benefit from a transportation network like you have here in New York where you could rely you know pretty much on on that network. We have a lot of last mile problems in San Francisco, and so I kind of see, at least in the near term, there I'm more optimistic. Where I do think that um, even if there's not this great integration between these, where I can pay once and kind of move throughout these transition points, I do think users will find workarounds and ways, like I do when I take the Caltrain home at night, and then for my last, you know, one and a half miles, I will take, you know, a, a Lyft line or, you know. Um, or an Uber pool ride uh, to get home. And so I think th that's where those combinations are where it gets easy. And I, see, I think it's kind of already happening. So I'm a little bit more optimistic. I mean, I, I, I think though what's important to remember is that we still have the lever as the public to help work with private companies to see um, the kinds of services that we want. We haven't given away um, our city yet, right? And so, um, I kind of am in this uh, position where I feel like, you know, uh, the data is being collected, but how can that benefit other kinds of city services? How can we work together to get, let's say, provide some of the last mile um, within some kinds of constraints? But I feel like cities are not, let's say, uh, I, uh, some of them, not all of them, are taking the positions like, oh, well, it's private against public, but... Is there some kind of uh, in between? But I mean, cities do still have controls. They can say yeah, Uber cannot come in. And I think that that needs to be in the conversation because what is it that we want to see from Waymo? It's not up for Waymo to decide that. It's up to our city planners to think about how do we want Waymo to be in our city and then take it from there and say, okay, Waymo, you can't use all your data for X or whatever. Put in the regulations that we need or not um, to help make some of those decisions. Um, are you all familiar with the Los Angeles mobility data specification? I think this is where they're trying to have a handle on this, that they work collaboratively, public and private uh, um, uh, groups together came up with this shared language 
where uh, if you want to do, if you want to be one of these private companies to do business in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, you have to share the data with the city so that the city can then in real time manage the traffic and build infrastructure that matches up. And I think this, in fact, we actually, it's one of the uh, projects in the exhibition, um, may be a direction that other cities can take. I just want to say, I don't, I wanna, I don't see my colleagues here. Um, we're going to um, probably open up to questions now. We're at quarter till eight. Do we have uh, somebody with a microphone that... Great. So uh, while while we're waiting for that, I want to um, just say ask: um, uh, Are there any questions you're dying to ask each other? Maybe you can ask each other a question or two while we're waiting for people to think about their their questions in the audience. Well, I'm interested um, from from Sarah what the what you think the the best um, leverage that that cities and city governments have in the world of data? What do, what do they control that, that the companies who are amassing the data want? Um, well, they can tell you whether you can operate on the city streets or not. It's huge, right? I mean, um, like the ability for Waymo to come to New York City is dependent on a contract that you would make, and so I think uh, cities need to be smart about these contracts, and they obviously want to have the services. It's to benefit to them to have the service. There's a win-win, but also to not give the data away when they do that. So there's th because the cities are operating the infrastructure that a Waymo will be using the streets. They have a they have a partnership with you to make sure the streets are maintained. You have a partnership with them to share data or, or work in certain kinds of regulatory fashion to recover some of the costs that will potentially be lost in terms of parking meters, um, other kinds of traffic, like cities have stand a lot of potential loss, but a lot of potential gain, and that needs to be factored. So why don't we open up? I know there are a lot of people have their hands up. Uh, we'll take the first, maybe we'll take a couple questions. Um, Hello. Hi, my name is David. This question is for everybody. Um, you mentioned Google and Alphabet as a uh, parent company. Can you speak on your involvement, um, if there is any, on the city of the future, the merging the digital and physical in Toronto that's happening, and what your thoughts about it are for the future? Why don't we take uh, another question? We have I have a question about the single payment system you mentioned briefly before. Um, for cities, do you think the city or the government should own the payment system and invite private partners to join the system? And also for Waymo as a private company, would you be interested in joining this kind of system to work with the city? Thank you. Um, I I can, I can just briefly take <coughs> um, uh, the question about the sidewalk labs um, development in, in Toronto. Um, I don't know uh, any more about um, uh, about it than what's sort of been published. I think it's a very, uh, very interesting. We actually um, talked to them at one point about about Public Square, and and they've actually developed their own version of the same idea. It's a sort of um, uh, hexagonal um, street paving system that has <laughs> infrastructure embedded. I'd, public hexagon doesn't have quite the same ring to it but um, other than that it's a very good idea and and you know they may be the ones who actually who actually get it to work yeah I don't know much about um, the sidewalk labs on, on the you know day-to-day -day specifics of what they're doing but I think it's um, encouraging to see that type of a project and it goes back to that experimentation yeah, and absolutely. trying different things that I think is really 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 interesting. Couple more questions. Um, hi, my name is Clara. Um, we spoke a lot about uh, digital infrastructure today, but I'm very interested in your thoughts on, you know, the very physical infrastructure that we still need. Um, even a self-driving car is still driving on a road. So um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how tech companies can contribute to that infrastructure rather than just profiting off of it. 
I can I can start with maybe um, sort of a practical sort of problem that that we think a lot about is that is that pick up and drop off experience that I mentioned earlier, and so is there. Um, you know, how do you do, how do you make for a good pick up and drop off experience? And I think that's one where it does take collaboration between whether it be, um, you know, businesses or the city to, to think about that and to do some, you know, to come up with a solution that works for not only autonomous vehicles, but of course for, um, you know, vehicles that are driven by humans. For the next, you know, while we are going to be in this hybrid state, right, where you're going to have autonomous vehicles, you're going to have people driving cars on the road, and they're, they're you know, that I think will be an interesting sort of phase of development to see what solutions come in place there. Other question? Yeah, that's kind of a follow-up on that one. How do you handle, this is more for Ryan, um, how do you handle the ethical dilemmas that happen in that hybrid state where you have autonomous vehicles and human-powered vehicles and humans are the cause of most accidents? And you talked about how you read an adult versus a child versus a bicycle, but the anomaly is going to happen where an adult makes it, you know, a, a strange move that's not accounted for, and then you have, a, you have accidents and you have liabilities with that. How, how do you tackle that problem? Well, there was a good article in the in the Atlantic. Um, I want to say it was maybe about two years ago, where it talked about the and, and I think Sarah kind of um, mentioned this in her presentation. We have a very large simulation engine, and so when our cars are out driving around in the real world, what we're doing is is we are taking that data and we um, we have a simulated environment where we run different um, as we are making changes to our software. We, we run those changes through that simula simulated environment, and we try to uncover scenarios where um, we might have to make refinements. And so that, that Atlantic article um, did uh, a great job of going into the detail around that, how we do that, and how we really kind of, again, when we think about you know, building the world's most experienced driver, that's, it's not just the driving that we do on the roads, but it's also this simulated environment that we leverage as well to really help us hone um, what we're doing. Isn't it true, like with artificial intelligence, and you have these fleets that all of the the cars are um, everything that one car learns, it can be translated to the rest of the. Yeah, that's true. It's like a good example would be if there's a construction, maybe a sort of ad hoc construction site pops up, you know, during the day uh, on a certain street. And if one of our vehicles encounters that that situation, it can let the rest of the fleet know. And, and maybe we would want to avoid that um, for some reason. And so we're able to sort of re learn that in real time. Yeah, kind of deep learning. Uh, other question? Hi, my name is Eric. I just love to hear your thoughts about the total disruption of some industries that AV will deliver, such as trucking, which directly or indirectly employs five million people, and the impact socially and economically and otherwise. Yeah, I think it's going to have a huge impact, and and um, it's not uh, it's not just you know the sort of long distance trucking, but all kinds of of. Um, goods and service deliveries, um, and there are going to be a lot of people out of work. Um, I, my hope is that the, that that change comes in a sort of slow and gradual enough way that we can, that we can adjust, and the, and the labor market and retraining can, can adjust to some of that, but it's definitely going to put um, some people out of work. Yeah, we were just talking earlier today about the shift from uh, getting money f going inside of a bank and getting withdrawing cash or making it a deposit, um, you know, versus the, you know, the way we do it now with ATMs or taking a you know a photo of your of a check, and so I, I don't know. I tend to be an optimist in the sense that I think as I think you have to be very aware of the effect that or that you will have on on different industries, but I also think as things sort of evolve, that um, as doors close, other ones open up, and. I guess that's that's how I, I, I think about it. I'm, I'm just going to say I think there's a good example of this from some of my work in um, Nairobi in Africa. I do a lot of work at the informal transit, and they move from informal transit to mass transit. Um, so there's, uh, you know, hundreds of thousand drivers in Nairobi. Uh, you're moving it to a BRT system. They're going to have a decrease. And... Uh, you need to have job training. So you need to have active. It can't. You can't say like it's going to happen. Like this is again where I'm saying governments need to remember there are, there are play in this and that pushing 
certain people in order to make those job training programs happen um, rather than saying it'll evolve, it'll happen, these people will have new jobs. In Nairobi, you have to actually actively help them figure out new markets in which to be um, part of the labor market. I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Hi, um, my name is Kenny. I have a question about mobility in general. Uh, this is for all the panelists, but how do you view the mo mobility needs over a life course? For example, do you want little school children taking AVs to school, or do you want them to go to a bus and you know, do it the tr traditional way? And also, I guess for, let's say, senior citizens who, uh, who may, might have to, who can't drive anymore, but then you still need to go out shopping, uh, they can, you know, I can see the AV application for there, but let's say for, I can also see for, let's say for a golf course where you have seniors who can't drive anymore to the golf course regularly, they can, that can be offered as a service by the golf course itself. Yeah, for me at least, that's, I think that's what, where things get interesting is, again, kind of going back to that idea of, of a service, so having access to a fleet of vehicles that might have different purposes, I think that's where things really get interesting, right? So you might have a vehicle that's easier to get in and out of, right, that might be geared towards people with, you know, that have, um, you know, issues there. Or if you're moving, right, into a new, a new apartment and you want a vehicle where you can, you know, kind of load more things into it. But um, that's what I get excited but I mean, it's kind of weird talking about that in New York City because most of you probably don't own cars. I have a car. Um, it's sitting in my garage and it sits there most of the time. But, um, you know, back in San Francisco, there still is sort of a, a, a need for a vehicle, you know, for different scenarios. And I think that idea of a service versus ownership is one that I get excited about. I think there's real applications in the health sector, too, with uh, uh, orphan seniors uh, where these are seniors who live alone and you can bring health services to them. We have a uh, inclusion in the exhibition, this AIM concept vehicle, which it's a unit that you can, it comes to you and provides um, a, a diagnosis. So there's all kinds of ways in all different sectors that this could be applied. One more in the front. Another question? Okay, uh, I'm Oli Hakanen, I come from Finland. Uh, which is nice because our culture is maybe easier to make it a uh, desirable future. But uh, after listening to you here and experts in general in New York, uh, I would ask you, what do you think? Shouldn't we take our conceptual thinking in a higher level? And my own suggestion is that uh, we should begin to start to plan people flow master plan, which is vehicle independent. It's not relying on vehicles, but it's looking just the uh, performance of people flow and the excellence of people flow. Um, I, th I think you have to, um, you ultimately have to look at, at moving people and how those flows work, but it's got to be across lots of different modes. So it's got to include walking, biking, cars, transit, all of that. Um, yeah, ultimately what you're looking at is moving people, or if you're talking about, um, you know, goods and services, that's another kind of, of mobility. And um, and it it works better when those systems work together, when transfers between one uh, and the other are easier. Um, you know, we struggled for, for decades in, in New York to, to try and get a one-seat ride to the airport, right? Still hasn't happened. Most other major cities in the US, uh, in, in the world, maybe not in the US, have that um, uh, experience, one-seat ride to the airport. Um, so the, the systems have to work together. <laughs> 